All right, you guys can go ahead and take a seat. Uh, amazing time of worship. It's cold this morning, right? Like, be honest. Who didn't want to get out of bed today because it was too cold? All right? Yeah, me too. Me too. It was, it was super cold. And this is not, uh, this is definitely not Florida weather. Uh, Johnny moved here expecting it to be a little bit uh, hotter. And he's like, Brent, you lied to me. You said it was going to be hot. And it's not. It's, it's cold. And so he's been freezing every morning. Uh, but it's, it's been a, a cool start to the new year. I, I've really enjoyed the cold. Uh, we've been able to start a fire in our house and our kids have loved that. And so I'm super thankful of that. You know, today we're kicking off this new series for the new year called I'm in Control. You know, I was thinking about the weather and how like we had to actually turn our heat on for the first time in the year. And, you know, I I like to think that I'm in control of the thermostat. Who here is in control of the thermostat in their home? Okay, yeah. I like to think, is is that my wife back there raising her hand? No, I'm in control and this is the problem. Like I'll set, I'll set the heat to a certain degree and that's where I want it to be. And I go back and it keeps going up for some reason. I'm like, what is taking place? And it's like this constant battle for control over the heat and really the electricity bill. Um, but anyway, being in control, you know, we, um, this week we put about a bunch of stuff on Facebook uh, about our series and I found this quiz. <clears throat> it was a control freak quiz. Like, are you a control freak? You answer a bunch of, a bunch of questions and it kind of gives you this percentage. And we had a lot of people kind of respond to that, take the quiz and share the percentage uh, that they got. Uh, And I I just wanted to share those with you. We had about a little bit over 30 people kind of share their percentage with us. Um, And I I tallied them all up and I decided to break them down into different brackets. Like who was zero to 30, who was 31 to 50, and who was above 50, right? Those real control freaks. Um, So of the 30, uh, we had nine who were uh, zero to 30, 30 below. Uh, a lot of them, uh, I think we had one person who was underneath 20, but mostly everyone else was right between the 20 to 30 range. Uh, and then in the 31 to 50 range, we had about 10 people. Uh, most of them were teetering on the edge of 50. And then above 50, we had uh, 13 people. So 19 below 50, 13 above. Uh, the highest score that we got was 76%. 76% control freak. And they are a member of our church. And we decided to give him the remote control to the projector screen just so that he could feel like he actually had control of something while he was here. I'm just kidding. We didn't do that at all. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a fun little quiz. Um, if you didn't get to take it, you can go um, on our Facebook page and take the quiz and see. And I'm not sure how, how true or, uh, this, this quiz really is, but it was, it was fun to take it. Um, I actually got a 24%, and I'm going to be real honest. Like I read that and was shocked because I, I expected it to be double that. Uh, and so I, I took it. And, I, and you know, one of the things as I was preparing for this series Um, I I was just learning about control, uh, why people control other people, why we have this need or desire to be in control. And as I'm studying and as I'm reading different articles and different things, I'm like, man, that sounds like me. Hey, you know what? That sounds like me. I'm like, oh my Lord, all these things sound like, man, I have control issues. Um, And so it's it's been uh, uh, really cool just preparing for this series. I'm excited about what God is going to teach us through this series. Now, maybe you weren't able to take the quiz and you're curious, am I a control freak? Or maybe you know and you're like, yeah, I need to solidify that. And so what I decided to do is I, I got some other questions. The ones that were on that quiz were a little bit basic. The ones that I'm about to share with you um, are a little bit more specific. And so what, what I would tell you is if you got your notes, you got your Connect card, uh, get your pen out. And as I read through these and as you read them, because they're going to be up on the screen, um, just put a tally mark for each one that sounds like you. And if like, you think that it sounds like you, write it. Don't, don't hesitate, don't think about it too much. Just, if you think it's yes, tally yes. And then at the end of this, there's 18 of them, or 19 of them. At the end of this, see how many tally marks you got. And, and you can really decide, you know, what areas of your life do you feel like you have control issues in? So here we go. Signs you might have control issues. Number one, you sincerely believe that others around you are incapable of doing something on their own and need your constant intervention just to do something right. Number two, you believe you know what's best for your spouse or partner, your family, or even your workplace. Number three, you are convinced that everything can be completed to perfection only with your involvement. Number four, you, uh, have, a, you, you have a hard time. You have to see it to believe it. Uh, five, you ha- have, are a bad listener who doesn't like hearing the other side of the story, and you often interrupt and talk over others. Six, you always assume a task or a chore will lead to failure without your involvement or advice. Seven, you're a workaholic and you love it. It helps you realize just how dependable you are and just how much others need you. Eight, you get frustrated when someone doesn't get you or doesn't understand that you're only trying to help them even if they aren't asking for your help. Nine, you can't take criticism and you only pretend like you can. 
Number 10, you, can, you want to be a perfectionist in everything you do and secretly feel threatened by anyone who may be better than you. 11, there's no pleasing you and you always find a reason to complain. Number 12, you set unreasonably high standards for yourself, which can leave you disappointed and frustrated or you expect high standards from everyone around you, even if you're not capable, they're not capable of achieving the high standards you set. Number 14, you don't like it when someone keeps secrets especially your loved ones. So you go out of your way to hear the truth, even if it means doing something unethical or wrong. 15, you like making decisions for others because you believe they can't make the right decision without your help. 16, you feel hurt and angry if someone declines to accept your help. 17, you hate delegating and would rather stay up all night working instead of sharing the burden with someone. 18, you're easily angered if your partner, angered if your partner or close friend makes the decision without hearing your suggestion first. And last is 19, you don't trust people and you always doubt their capability and sincerity. Do any of those sound like you? Do many of those sound like you? you now I think each of us can probably relate to a few of these things. You know, our, our hope with this series is um, as we dive into our control issues and and see what God's word has to say about it. Our hope is that we can uh, be challenged and begin to combat the control issues in our lives, the things that we try to control, and also the things that are trying to control us. I wanna pray with you guys and dive into this. God, right now, God, as we, we come to you, full well knowing that we do have control issues in our life, God, I pray that as we dive into your word today, and you would speak to us, you would allow us to, to be a little bit vulnerable, to, to, to open up our, our heart and our mind to what you're trying to say to us. Many times the things that we have control issues with are because we aren't willing to surrender it to you, God. So right now, in this place, I pray that we would surrender to your word, to your, your challenge today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. All right, so I'm just curious, how many Lego lovers are there out there? Like, you love Legos, you're an adult, and you still love playing with Legos. Am I the only adult? Okay, good, I'm not. Um, I, I, I've always enjoyed Legos. I remember playing with them when I was a little kid, and now that I, I have kids, I get to buy Legos for my kids, which, honestly, I'm not buying them for my kids. They're for me, okay? I buy them the cool Legos so that I can put them together and play with them. Now, the crazy thing about Legos today from when I grew up, like, they are crazy, like... Um, the Legos that I used to play with, this is actually a toy. You can put that picture up there. This is a Lego that, that I had when I was growing up, that guy right there. Dude, he was awesome, okay? I had my, my, my horse and the guy with the spear, and, and like this was the coolest Lego, right, that, that I, I ever had. Now, that's amazing, right? Go to the next picture. These are the Legos that my kids get today. Like, oh my God, like how do you even make that? Like, it's, it's nuts. Like, putting those things together, there's, like, this booklet. It's, like, 200 pages, and it's, like, these detailed instructions, and it, it's so hard to put together, and, and then you come out with this amazing masterpiece. And so here's the deal. I'll, I'll get my, my kids a, a toy like that, a Lego like that, and we'll, we'll put it together, and we'll spend time, and we'll, we'll go through it, and we, we get to the end, and we're like, yes, this is awesome. Let's go play with it. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't get to play with the Lego. We're going to put that thing on a shelf. We're going we're gonna to put it like behind a, a case, a glass case, or we're going to saran wrap it. We built this, and now you don't get to play with it. Anyone else like that? Like you want to build it and then set it and just admire your great creation. That's what I do. I don't, I, don't, I don't want my kids to play with the Legos at all. But, you know, the thing about Legos, the greatest thing about Legos is the, the amount of just uh, things that you can build. You know, the, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, it's, it's great to take what they gave you and to build it. But after that, man, you have all these Legos and you can do whatever you want. But man, for me, I just, I want to get the craggle. You guys know what the craggle is, right? If you don't, it's crazy glue. It's from the Lego movie. Go watch it. It's fantastic. I want to I glue the Legos together and I, I want to just set them and I want to leave them. And I, wanna, I try to control it. And, and whenever I do that, what I'm doing is I'm stifling creativity and fun for my kids. And so there's just a little thing there. And, you know, with Legos, it's not very serious. But other areas in our lives where we try to control situations or people, circumstances or the outcomes, those things are very serious. And so my main, my main point that I, I want you to get today as we unpack today is this, is that surrendering control to God frees us from needing to be in control. 
Surrendering control to God frees us from needing to be in control. Now, each of us in our lives, depending on what kind of control issues that we are facing, there's probably a reason. There's, there's, there's probably an issue uh, or something that related to your control issue. Maybe it's a, a traumatic or abusive life experience that you faced. And for me, apparently, I had a traumatic experience with Legos when I was younger, and now I try to control them. But it, it could also be a lack of trust. It could be anxiety. It could be fears of abandonment. It could be a low or damaged self-esteem. Maybe it's perfectionism. Or maybe... It's emotional sensitivity and really just wanting to avoid any kind of emotional, painful experiences. And today what we're going to look at is trust. And in the rest of our series, we're going to unpack some of those other things like anxiety and fear and doubt and and insecurity and how those things control us. But today what I really want to do is I want to focus on trust because I believe trusting God with control will give us freedom. And that's what we desire. You know, many times our control issues in our lives, they're, they're sinful or selfish by nature. And this is what Romans 6, 8 has to say about it. It says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. So when we let, let the, the, the sinful and selfish nature control us, it leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind, well, that'll lead to life and peace. You know, we're in control. When we think we need to have control, it leads to death. When we put God in control and the spirit in control, it leads to life and peace. Some, some reason, we, we think if, if we can control people, if we can control the, the circumstance, if we can control the outcome, everything and everyone will be better because of it. But the reality is, is that the more we try to control, the more resistance that we face. And in the end, what we try to control ends up being worse than we thought it was going to be in the first place. I think that most of us who try to control other people, we have issues trusting other people. We don't trust their judgment. We don't trust their abilities. We don't trust that they can do it as good as we could do it. We don't trust them to make the right choices. You know, this comes into play as you become an adult because you're, you're given, you know, control really of your children. You're given responsibility more of your children and, and you want them to make the right choice. Now, I am most controlling over my children when I don't think they're going to make the right choice. And, and for, you know, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but a lot of times I just, I don't think they're going to, and so I don't even give them the opportunity. Like my three boys, they're uh, nine, six, and six. I don't trust them outside anymore, and they go out back, and it's a fenced, and they've gone out there so many times and broke stuff and threw stuff, and they're throwing stuff over the fence and hitting cars, y'all. I don't trust them back there anymore. My two-year-old? My two-year-old, I don't trust her in the pantry by herself because she tries to eat everything, even things that aren't edible, okay? And like, I try to control that. I can try to, you, don't, you can't go in the pantry. You can't go out back. And many times, instead of influencing my children, I control them. And so what I do is I say, you're not going to make the right choice in this situation, so I'm not even going to allow you to experience that. And what I do is I take them from being able to learn and grow from that moment. I keep myself from influencing them in that moment, from taking something, a choice that they make and saying, hey, here's the choice that you did make. Here's what you should have done. It's a, it's a growing moment for them. It's a moment for me to influence the choices that they make instead of trying to control the choices that I think they're going to make. There's a huge difference, and it comes to trust. Do I trust? Do I trust that they're going to make the right choices? Am I giving them the opportunity to do that? So I miss those important opportunities. And I, I believe that surrendering control to God, it leads to life and peace. Life and peace, like the scripture says, for you, but it also leads to life and peace for the people around you. Because you get life and peace because you're not stressing and, and, and overreacting to situations. And they get life and peace because you're not constantly like trying to control who they are. Life and peace comes when we surrender control to God. Now here's, here's the big thing, and I, I think a lot of people think about surrendering control to God, that, that means that they're not going to be able to do anything that they ever want. Even though you surrender control to God, you will always have control of your choices. Always. And that, I think that's the greatest thing about who God is. God, man, God gave us the gift of free will. He gave us free choice. When he created us, he didn't say, you have to love me and you have to live this way. He said, no, I'm going to give you a choice. It's up to you. And I think that's the greatest, the greatest thing about God is that he gives us choice. We're not mindless, emotionless robots. 
He says, will you choose to love me? I would love for you to love me. And while it is true that he gives us control over our choices, when God is in control of our life, he will have a positive influence over our choices. And that's what he wants. He wants us to give him control so that the, the things that we're choosing are, are positive instead of negative. God wants to affect your life. He wants to affect your character. He wants to affect your, your spiritual growth, the choices that you make. And he wants to do that through the influence of his son, through the influence of his word, and through the influence of the Holy Spirit. God wants to influence you. He doesn't want to control you. He's never wanted to control you. Yet, isn't it funny that we are made in the image of God and he isn't trying to control us, but we are constantly trying to control other people. God wouldn't do that, so why do we do that to other people? We can't. I mean, the reality is we can't. We can't control other people. We can't control the choices that they make. We can't control how they're going to react. We can't control what the outcome of the situations that they're in, but we can, we can influence them. And there's a difference. There's a difference between influence and control. You see, influence is modeled. Influence is something that will affect people, affect their choices, and hopefully it's a positive influence. Control is forced on people. Control is exerted upon people. And that's not how God uh, treats us, and that's not how we should treat other people. God has, has given us the influence of his son. And he says to each and every one of us, if you choose my son, you can begin to model your life after my son and have positive influences in your life, and you will begin to positively influence other people around you. And when you do that, they will begin to trust you. And that's the biggest thing about control is trust. Trust is a huge part of control. We need to be able to trust one another. You see, in order to surrender control, you have to be willing to trust whoever you are surrendering it to, whether it's God, whether it's somebody else. Surrendering control, and you want to write this down, surrendering control to God requires complete trust in God. You have to trust him. You have to trust who he is. Now, as I was preparing this series and this message, I got to thinking about uh, the story of Abraham, just this whole story, his story in general who Abraham is. And if you don't know the story of Abraham, he's a pretty big name in the Bible, pretty big name in, in Christianity. And he's, he's one of the heroes of faith. He has incredible faith. And, and, and his faith goes back to when it all started, when God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, leave where you're at. And I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. God didn't say, hey, you're going to this destination. Here's a Google Maps and here's all the details that you need. He said, get up and go. And Abraham went. And there was this, this immense faith that Abraham possessed in his life. And after Abraham went, God says to him, hey, I want you to know that I, I have a, just a, a plan for your life. And I promise that your descendants will be as, mult, as, as many as the, the stars in the skies. And you will be the father of, of my people, the nation of Israel. So there's this faith and there's this promise. And you continue reading Abraham's story. And you know, there's the, a roller coaster of things that are going on, but that promise it, it, it never comes to light, and years and years and years go by, and Abraham and his wife Sarah are wondering, when is this promise going to come true? When are we going to have a child? When are we going to begin to you know, be the, the father of the nation of Israel? And so they wait, and they wait, and they wait. They begin to doubt, and they begin to not trust God's timing, and, and when they get to that moment in their life, they begin to try to control the situation. And so Sarah says to Abraham, Abraham, this isn't happening. I think we need to take matters into our own hands. So why don't you sleep with my maidservant, Hagar? And, and, and if you have a child with her, I will raise the child, and that child will be the, you know, the, the nation of Israel. And so Abraham says, okay, let's do this. It's not happening the other way, so let's make it happen. Let's take this into our own control. And so Hagar has a child. And wouldn't you know it, it doesn't turn out how they expected it. Sarah then becomes jealous and resenting of Hagar because she was able to have a child with Abraham and, and, and Sarah was not. And so they end up sending Hagar and her child Ishmael away and they almost die in the wilderness. And see, when we begin to control situations where God says, no, I got this, man, things get messy. The outcome is not in our control. We think it is. Anyway, that, that takes place. And they go through that. And then finally, finally, the, the promise for, for Abraham and Sarah to have a child of their own. It comes true. 
And they have Isaac, and it's, it's wonderful, and it's amazing. And then you keep reading, and then all of a sudden, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I need you to take your son, your one and only son that you've waited forever for, and I need you to sacrifice him on the mountain to me. And you read that, and you're like, wait a second, what? This, this is crazy. Why, why, is this, why is this taking place in Abraham's life after all the waiting, after all the promises, after all the faithfulness? Why would God challenge Abraham in this way? As I read Abraham's story and all the things that he did and hear it, like Abraham, no one will question the amount of faith that Abraham had. But as I look at this story and other stories, I begin to realize that Abraham had a problem with trusting God completely, trusting his timing, trusting his plan. And so you begin to wonder, why would God do this? Why would God challenge him in this way? And it's because God wanted Abraham to fully trust him and to have complete faith in him. Here's where the story takes place in Genesis. It's chapter 22, verse one. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain and I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. And you read that. And in this moment, what you see is complete surrender to the perfect will of God. There's no hesitation. There's no questioning. There's no pausing. He gets up and he goes and he goes off to do what God says he was supposed to do. And we see now that Abraham's willing to trust you know, I was thinking about it. I was like, after this whole thing takes place, um, I wonder if Abraham told Sarah. I wonder if Abraham had said, Sarah, hey, Sarah, here's what God said. You think it's good? I feel like Sarah would have scooped Isaac up, kicked Abraham, and just ran with her child. Okay, that's what my wife would do. She'd be like, you cray cray. God wouldn't ask you to do that. So I think maybe after the fact, Abraham and, and uh, Isaac had a little pact. Hey, don't tell mom. mom. Mom will freak out. Mom can't handle this. Anyway, uh, they, they go off to do this deed, right? And Abraham's about about to do it. He's getting ready to do this thing. They, they've reached the mountain. He has his son there and he's got the knife. And in Genesis 22, verse 10, here's what it says. Then Abraham took his knife and he was about to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham answered, yes. The angel said, don't kill your son or hurt him in any way. And here it is. Now I can see that you trust God. Now I can see that you trust God. You see, Abraham didn't lack faith. He lacked trust. And God was challenging him this moment. Do you, do you trust me? Do you trust my plan? Do you trust what I'm doing? You see, it's one thing to have faith. It's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to trust God with every area of your life. Listen to me. The demons believe in God. Satan believes in God. That doesn't mean that they're trusting God to control their life. It's a, it's, a, it's a completely different thing to trust God. Yes, you want to have faith, but you also have to trust God with every area of your life. Do you trust him? Do you trust God's plan for your life? Do, do, you, do you trust God with your finances, with your future, with your family, with, with your relationships? Do you trust God? You know, maybe a better question would be this. Do you still trust God when you lose finances? When you lose a friend? When you lose a family member? Do you still trust God when your plan doesn't go how you wanted it to go? Or your expectations are not met? Do you trust God when your present circumstances are overwhelmingly and seemingly hopeless? Do you still trust God when your teen or preteen or, or your child has become overly rebellious and there's no end in sight? Do you still trust God when he doesn't answer your prayers in the time that you wanted? Or maybe he didn't answer the way that you wanted. You know, it, through difficulty and, and trials, it's, it's hard to, to completely trust God and, and surrender everything to him. 
And Abraham was asked to sacrifice his one and only son. You talk about a difficult choice. You talk about, man, do I really trust God with this? Am I really trusting a God that would tell me this? And he does it. I don't know about you, but I hear that and I read that and I say, why? Why was Abraham so willing to sacrifice his only son? Didn't hesitate, didn't pause, just went and did the thing. It's because he had complete trust in a sovereign God. He believed, had the faith, and he trusted that God's plan was perfect and that God was in control. In Hebrews 11, verse 19, it says this about Abraham. It said that Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. That is faith and trust in a God that can do the impossible. And that is what God desires in our life. Abraham was willing to surrender control of really the one thing that was most important to him, his son, Isaac. The one thing that he waited for his entire life, he was willing to surrender control. And I wonder today for you, what is that one thing? One thing in your life that you are not willing to give God control of. Maybe it is your finances. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's with your health. What is that one thing in your life? Do you trust God in every area of your life? Until you do, until you're willing to surrender control to God, there will be a constant fight and a constant battle for control of your life. It's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to completely trust him with your life.